Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Caleb. Nice to see you today. I'm um, so glad you're here and just grateful to be uh, part of this. I'm part of the teaching team here and just grateful to be part of this series, Power Family. But I want to just pull us back into that song we just sang. That um, A lot of times we, we'll sing a song and it's like, man, that song is beautiful. Or, wow, what, what incredible words. But we might not notice how powerful of a statement we just made. So just as a reminder, what we just sang out together, we declared as a, as a community, as a family together, is that the God who created all things, the God of, the, of, of eternity, that he is committed to you and to me, and that we'll never wake up in a day where he is failing us. Now, I, I, can, I, I, I will say this. There will be days where he may disappoint what I want. But it will be for my good. It'll be for his glory. He won't fail. And I was thinking about this in connection with what we're going to talk about the rest of this morning, which I got to get to because I don't want to go too long. But there's a man named Moses, and he, he goes and he meets with the God of the Bible, the God that we are in relationship with. And he meets him on a mountain. And on that mountain, he says, God, I want to see your face. And he has this whole interaction. And God says, well, you can't see my face and live. So, so I'll hide you in the rock and then I'll walk by and then I'll declare my name to you. But when, when God says his name, he says, my name is Yahweh. But then he describes himself. One of the ways he describes himself is that he lavishes unfailing love to a thousand generations. He lavishes unfailing love to a thousand generations. Unfailing, steadfast, committed, unfailing love to a thousand generations. And let me just tell you, for Moses, for the Israelites who first read that, here's what that meant, forever. <laughs> a thousand generations is a really long time. Guess what? We haven't really got to a thousand generations since then yet. A thousand generations that every generation of those who would walk with this God would experience him as a God who doesn't fail and who has unfailing love. And that is incredible. And it's that God that Moses wanted and God desired that every generation would know that there is a God of unfailing love. So trust him. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, all right, I'm going to pray for a moment and then shift into the, the passage. So let's do that. Lord, um, you are the same God that Moses met on the mountain. You are a God rich in mercy and compassion. You are a God that's slow to anger and is full and abounding, and overflowing with steadfast, unfailing love. And you pour that love to a thousand generations of those who trust in you. And we are recipients of that same unfailing love from an unfailing God. So Lord, I pray that I'd get out of your way this morning and that you would speak what you desire in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, now, if you've been at River Run for a while, then here's what you know. You know that on a pretty much an annual basis, we like to take a little time, typically, as we enter into the fall and we're getting, the parents are getting school supplies and we're getting ready to launch into the, the season, uh, to, to take a little time to focus in on ministry within the context of family. And we're doing that again this year. If you're new to River Run, fair warning, there's a good chance that if you, which I hope you do, stick around for the years to come and get woven into this community, that you'll find that, that, that we do that on a regular basis every year. And we do that not because it's like, oh, um, oh, it's time to do family, family talk time. We do that because we believe what you've heard for the last couple of weeks, that family is the most influential organization in the world. It is incredibly powerful, and that is proven. And so if it's powerful, if it's influential, and it's this thing, thing that I'm saying all of us are in some way a participant in, then we need to consider how God desires us to interact within the most influential organization where any of us are a part of. And I want to encourage you, and I think you've, you've been pulled into this the last couple of weeks already, but as we walk through this kind of a series, or even as I talk today, don't allow your current family dynamic to determine whether or not you listen to me. Please, please. All right? Don't think, all right, well, this isn't for me because I'm not currently a parent with um, um, school-age kids in my household. So therefore, I just got to sit through the next 25 minutes of Caleb talking. 
We'll sing a song and I'll go home. All right. Don't do that. Tune in because I, I, what I want to do today, what I'm hoping happens today, is that we will all feel pulled into the game. That we'll all recognize that whatever season we're in and whatever season our family may be in, we are called to participate. It's still an influential relationship we have. And when it comes to family, I mean, the reality is on one end, we all feel the power of family. We either feel the, the absence of it, we feel pain from those relationships, or we feel the blessing of it, or a mixture of those last two. We all have experienced the power of family. And everyone that's connected to us via our family web, both with our children, with our parents, with our siblings, with grandparents and grandchildren, everyone connected in that family web, they're feeling one of those things from us, either the absence of that relationship, the pain that that can cause, or the blessing it can bring. It's still powerful. And so the question isn't, for each one of us, the question isn't whether or not we have influence in our families. We do. And some of us may feel like, wait, I don't know. I'm, this one doesn't ever listen to me, right? No, we do. We have influence in our families. The question isn't whether we have influence in our family. The question is whether that influence is intentional and whether it's good. The question isn't whether or not we have influence in our families. The question is, is it intentional influence? And is it good? And so my hope is that as we wrap up this morning, that we kind of feel prompted to examine the way we're engaging with the scope of our family and consider, am I engaging in a way that is intentional? And that is good. Um, and my, my, my heart is that. It's really that we would reexamine the way we think about our vision for family, both in the sense of who we are to engage with and influence and how long we are to participate in influencing their lives. Because in reality, as we look at Scripture, while in this series is, is, is focusing in on the importance of, of parents being the primary disciple makers in the lives of their kids, but the reality is that when we look at Scripture, while that is a, the central building block there are other components to God's vision for family. That it's not just parents to children, it's about generations. And that's what we see, that God's vision for family is from generation to generation. God's vision for family is from generation to generation. Now, I've had a unique experience in my own life, and I, and I recognize it's a unique experience. I have been really blessed to be a part of a multi-generational family. And let me give you a couple of glimpses into my life. And, and, and I'm, I'm so grateful and I recognize it's a unique gift. Growing up, my great-grandfather, Edwin Arthur, my great-grandfather, he struck me out playing baseball and he beat me at golf. All right, so I got to experience that. Now, not only that, but also my great-grandfather, I sat at a table while, while he and my great-grandmother, I heard them pray. I was with them in church and saw them worship God. I heard them sing hymns. Like, that's a memory I have. That's something that's seared into my heart. In fact, my, my oldest daughter, Lily, was held by them. So her great-great-grandparents held Lily and prayed for Lily when she was a baby. And I believe Grace as well, they passed away shortly after Grace was born. That's unique. I recognize that. And that's a gift in my life. My, my grandmother, I, I used to take walks with my grandmother and, and um, we'd walk around and she would talk about her testimony with me. She would tell stories of what God had done in her and my grandfather's life. She would tell me like miracles that she had seen happen and, and, and stories of that. That is unique and it's a gift to me. Um, this last fall, last year, um, I was able to get up to Michigan in time as my grandfather was, was passing away, and I was able to be there at the side of his bed as he took his last breath. I was with him to that point, and one of the last phrases he said was, he breathed out that he loved me. That's unique. And even as I talk about it, I almost feel this weird sense of both deep gratitude and almost a, a, a guilty, like, spoiled. I feel spoiled in that. And I, in some ways, I am 
if spoiled was a bad thing, right? If it wasn't for the fact that spoiled is supposed to be a bad thing. I was gifted with, with the experience of multi-generational family. And I think about that, and I'll talk at the end another aspect, but that's God's vision. God's vision is something generational that doesn't just have in view an 18-year window of life when he thinks about the influence in family. He has in view the entire lifespan of someone and the lifespan of those who will come after them. That's what he has in view from generation to generation. You know, I, and I've experienced this, this ongoing influence as well. Not only is it like every generation has influence, but also like the participation in that, that I am 40, by the way. I turned 40 since last time I spoke, so happy birthday to me. Yeah, that's right. I'm 40 now. Um, so I'm 40 years old, and yet to this day, I still feel greatly a deep sense of encouragement when my family, my parents will affirm me or speak words of kindness to me. It carries a heavy weight. I've also felt the deep pain of knowing I, I, I disappointed one of my parents. At 40 years old, that still has power in my life. I've also seen the reverse of that. I've seen the way that my words going upward in the family can provide great love and encouragement to my parents when I speak to them about just the way their relationship with the Lord encourages me or just thankfulness for the way they've parented me. I have seen that. I've also seen the way that I can cause great pain for my parents. My sibling relationships, we're all adults. And yet in my sibling relationships, I've experienced the, the, the leaning into one another for encouragement, a listening ear when you're struggling, comfort, counsel because you don't know what to do with mom and dad. Just kidding, just kidding. That was a joke, by the way, mostly. All right, yeah, I've experienced that with siblings. And this vision is, is really what God has in mind, that we begin to see this powerful organization of family as not something that's just earthly powerful, but that is eternally powerful, that is spiritually powerful, that God has designed it to build His kingdom and to grow His people. In order to talk about it, we're going to be in Psalm 78. So if you've got your Bible, you can flip there. If you don't, that's fine. All the scriptures will be on the screen. Before we get to Psalm 78, I want to give us a little quick background from a guy named Moses. So what we're going to read is written about 500 years after this. But in Deuteronomy, Moses is standing at the border of the Promised Land talking to the people of Israel. The first real, like, full-on community of people who are called on to trust in God and live in relationship with Him. They've been saved from slavery, much like us. Saved from slavery, brought rescued from death, delivered from oppression, and now God has built a relationship with them, given them His presence, given them His ways to walk in, said, come follow me and walk with me. And now they're going to go into the Promised Land, a land that had been promised to their ancestors. So as they're going to, Moses is at the end of his life and is speaking to them and is giving them counsel from the Lord on how to have a fruitful, continued legacy in that promised land, a legacy of faith. And here's what he says to them in Deuteronomy 4, 9 and 10. You'll see it here on the screen. He says, watch out, though. Watch out. Be careful never to forget what you yourself have seen. Do not let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live. And be sure to pass them on to your children and grandchildren. That's the warning. Remember, don't forget what you've seen of God's work and God's ways. And when he says remember, it doesn't just mean remember it and hear, but that you got to talk about it. That if you remember, you will tell your children and your grandchildren. Three generations woven together in the same story. And then it says this, Never forget, never forget the day when you stood before the Lord your God at Mount Sinai, where He told me, summon the people before me and I will personally instruct them. Then they will learn to fear me as long as they live. And they will teach their children to fear me also. For some of us, that word fear we might think is like, oh, they'll want to run away. No, it's not like terrified and I want to run away. It's trust and I want to honor. I want to bow. That 
that God had spoke to them at Mount Sinai. Now Moses passes on them and says, hey, hey, listen. Teach your children and the grandchildren that generation after generation would know what I have done and what my ways are. So that every generation will experience the joy that is found in trusting God and walking in His ways. All right, so now we skip ahead 500 years later. All right, so, and over those 500 years, let me tell you what they did. They forgot a whole lot. The Israelites go in the promised land, and and one generation, uh, one generation into the promised land, we find out that a whole group of kids grew up there and never heard what God had done or what His ways were to walk in. Come on, guys. And they unravel. And over those 500 years, there's all kinds of brokenness and their culture shatters and it doesn't, it's not rooted in a relationship with God or His ways and they look just like the world around them and they're hurting one another and fighting with each other and having civil wars, being attacked by others. And it is just chaos over those 500 years. And then around the end of that 500 years, there was the gift of a king that God calls to once again rescue them. And that king was David. And God used David that in a way like he'd used Moses to rescue them from their enemies, to help them be back at peace, and to regather them around God's instructions, his way of life, to orient their life around relationship with God. And so here they are again at kind of a fresh beginning. And in those days, there was a, a writer. In the days of David and then his son Solomon, there was a writer, a, a songwriter named Asaph. And in Psalm 78, this is a song that he wrote to instruct the people, just like Moses had. How do we now have an ongoing legacy of peace and relationship with God? What does it look like to live as his people in this world? And here's what he sings, beginning in Psalm 78, beginning in verse 1. One through three. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. I should sing it all, but I'm not going to because it doesn't sound the same in English as it probably did in Hebrew. Um, Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. Now, this is a reference all the way back to Moses' day. See, there's these stories that are there in in our written memory, our written records. There are stories that were there from our ancestors. And let me remind us of those again. Now, it goes down to verse 4. And he says, We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord about his power and his mighty wonders. Now, you hear it's the same kind of language that Moses had used. And if you're going to write something down, I say, it's, this is about telling others what God has done. Telling our family what God has done, the works of God. Now, for Moses' day, that was to tell your children about what God had done when he came to Egypt and saved you from your slavery and brought you through that sea and conquered your enemies and then gave you a relationship and was with you like a a pillar of fire and a cloud and was present with you. Tell your kids about that. And in this day, it's that plus and how then when you were rebelling against him and your enemies were all in the land and you were fighting with one another, God gave you a king you never deserved. And he rescued you from your enemies and he's brought you peace again in his kingdom in, in David. Tell the next generation. It goes on, verse 5 and 6. For he issued his laws to Jacob. That's back in Genesis. He gave, yeah, but it's speaking there, uh, J- Jacob is from Genesis, but now it's speaking about when from Jacob's uh, ancestors or Jacob's descendants were Israel, the people at Mount Sinai. He issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. Now, I highlighted these because we got here kind of this. Here was the idea from the beginning that this would be the ones alive. They would teach their children who would also be alive then so that These people are thinking all the way down the line. The children that aren't yet born would receive the same understanding of what God had done. What God has done 
who God is and how God calls us to live. And that those not yet born would then turn and they'd tell their own children, the children of the children not yet born. So think about what is being asked to be in mind here for the ancestors to think, wait, I'm to think beyond just an 18-year window to my entire life being invested, not just in my lifetime, but in the generations yet to come. That's the idea here. Four generations that they would remember the works of God and walk in His ways. The whole idea here is to pass on really those three things I mentioned. What God has done, what God is like, and how God calls us to live. That those would be passed on from generation to generation to generation. Verse Verse 7, I love this. Verse 7 now says this. So, now this is a connective meaning. The whole reason, the whole reason to generation to generation keep passing this on is for this reason. So each generation should set its hope anew on God. Not forgetting His glorious miracles, what He has done, and not forgetting to obey His commands, how He's called us to live. They will not be, then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Now, I want, I, I almost cut this verse off because <laughs> it's like a bad ending to the passage, right? In some ways. But what the psalmist is doing here, Asaph, is he's, he's singing and teaching the people when, when they learn this to remember that, yes, they have the first ancestors who recorded what God had done in saving them from Egypt and meeting them at Mount Sinai and bringing them in the promised land. But since then, that has broken down. It hasn't all worked how it was supposed to. And I think there's an encouragement for us. Because guess what? In all of our family stories, it hasn't all worked like it was supposed to. It hasn't. It hasn't all worked like that design that Moses presented. And yet now Asaph says, hey, this generation is reinvited into the multi-generational story of God and His people. You're reinvited into it. And this song was to be learned by all the people, whatever age, whatever part of the, the community they were, wherever they were at in their own families at the time, they were to learn this song and be reinvited into it. And I think it's very reasonable to say that even those who didn't have children in their household were hearing from this an invitation to pass on what God has done, what He is like, and how He's called them to live to whatever connections they had to the generation before them, the generation alongside them, the generation after them for the sake of the ages yet to come. So that each generation would set its hope anew on God. See, the goal, the vision that God has for you and me in our family relationships, and I know it, it's, it's big, but the goal is that there are generations from our families that are even yet to come. And the vision is that the way we would invest our lives in our families would lead to generations after, you, after we are gone putting their hope in God. And we do that simply by investing our life intentionally in a way that passes on what God has done, what He is like, and how He's called us to live. So what does that look like if I'm a disciple of Jesus? And I was thinking about this kind of correlation. Because when we talk about influence in our families, what we're really talking about is the idea of discipleship, which is passing on what we, have, what we receive from Jesus. But in our own life of discipleship, being a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, here's what it means. It means being a disciple of Jesus means giving Him influence over my life for the rest of my life. Giving Him influence in my life for the rest of my life. Now, for the rest of my life has a dual meaning here in this sentence. The first meaning is that there will never be a day of my life that I don't want to give, give Jesus influence over my life. 
in how I think, in how I live, and how I, how I behave. Amen. But also, there's this lifelong vision that Jesus has for Caleb's life. So I've been a disciple of Jesus for the last about 20, 23 years. So 17 was when I really started to follow Jesus. So the last 23 years, I can notice that when Jesus was discipling me in my 20s, there were things he had in mind for me now at 40 as I'm parenting my kids in this season or I'm working in a different ministry than I ever thought I would be or I'm doing things I didn't expect to do. That he had a long-range vision in what he was invested in in my life. Giving him influence in my life for the rest of my life. And there's a correlation there between that and what we're to think about when we think about discipleship in our families, both with our children and also with our siblings, maybe with our nieces and nephews, maybe with our parents, maybe with our grandparents, that discipleship in our families is really about the same thing. It's about influencing their lives for the rest of their lives. It's the long game in the lives of our kids, the next generation. It's the long game in the lives of our siblings, Investing in their lives for the rest of their lives. Um, and, and, and I want to say, I, I think our desire for instant gratification can really be an obstacle to long-term investment. The return on investment in family is huge. It is an immense return on investment. But it doesn't always get us instant gratification, Right? I mean, I think about it in parenting. There are times where in that day would be easier if I didn't have this conversation or if we just did it this way or I just avoid that, right? There's days that are like that. But if I think about the long game of the life of my kids, then it calls me into considering that in how I invest in their lives. And my siblings, I got a sister and a brother. You know, I'll tell you, my sister, my brother, like, I, I've not always been good at returning phone calls <laughs> or responding. I've had long uh, dead times of interactions where I've been distracted by many other things. And, and yet, specifically, I think about my sister, um, there was a long season where she just kept on reaching out to me, checking in with me. She wasn't getting instant gratification, and yet she continued towards the long-term investment. And our relationship is stronger, and she's influenced my heart for the Lord and my heart for my family. One, one I want to close out with one, one story and then give you a last point. Um, my, I mentioned one aspect of my great-grandparents. My grandparents, the other side of my family, my, uh, my grandfather didn't know the Lord and um, said he, he wouldn't. He wasn't going to. Um, my dad's dad. And I remember growing up, and, and he, there were some difficulties at times and, and, and things like that. Over my first 17 years, I think I was 16, almost 17, when, when he, he passed away. Over those years, regularly we would show up at their door. Regularly we would come by and have a meal or invite them or go to the lake together with them. Um, there wasn't instant gratification in influencing the, his heart for the Lord. For all those years, many times, my dad, he's a zealous person, very much passionate about evangelism, telling people about Jesus. Many times that was a brick wall. We just stayed present in his life. We just continued to. My grandfather then had um, brain cancer, and it was very difficult last couple years. Lung cancer, brain cancer of his life. And, and you know what? My mom showed up, became kind of his caregiver and was caring for him and, and praying with him when he was struggling and uh, helped clean up messes and, and carry him around and move him. And my dad was there at the bedside regularly as he was walking through all this. And near the end of his journey, my grandfather Surrendered his life to Jesus. He, he 
put trust in him and I'm going to see him forever. And, and the reason is that my parents played the long game. They didn't bail, but they just continued to invest in those relationships. And I think what I want to just leave us with before we're going to take communion in a moment is that when God looks at you within your family relationships, and I know all of our dynamics look different, um, but God has a long-term vision for our family relationships. He has a long-term vision for them. Do we is the question. Do we? And I just want to encourage us to consider what would it look like for us to start to shape our thinking about family around God's vision for generation to generation? What would it look like for us to invest our lives, to have intentional and good influence in the lives of our families, in, in our kids' lives, in our siblings' lives, in our parents' lives, in, in, in our, our, our spouse li spouse's life, in our grandparents' life, our grandchildren, you name it. What would it look like? I think a couple things to have in mind is, is what Moses and Asaph instructed. Is to consider, hey, those in my family where I have influence, do they know why I trust God? Do they know why? How can I help them? Can I talk about why I trust God? Maybe instead of just telling them why they should, do they even know why I do? Because what Moses and Asaph say is, hey, tell what God has done for you already. What you know that God has done. And tell them what God is like. That you know. They know why you trust God. And then the second is related. But is it evident to those in my family where I have influence? Is it evident to them that, that I trust Him? Is it evident that He is influencing the way I live? Now, this isn't a, a baseball bat over the head for anybody in here. It's just a simple invitation to, hey, in the, by the grace of God, let's just consider, do those that I have influence in, do they know why I trust God? And is it evident to them that my life is shaped around the love and the truth that God has given me? You know, we are going to take communion, and I, I want to give you freedom. Um, as What we're going to do is actually, you, you may already have it. Does, we have them already, maybe? If you don't, there should be some on the tables in the back. So um, if you don't, you can get them um, if you desire to participate in this. But here's how we can think about this in context of today's message, is that um, the, the Old Testament people were given, a, all the Israelites were given an annual feast called Passover to consistently remember what God has done, what He's like, and why we follow Him. And the New Testament, Jesus gave us this he gave us this regular meal, not just annual, to consistently remind ourselves, to sit around the table, if you will, as a family, as a natural opportunity for us to look around and, and maybe we're sitting next to our spouse or we're sitting or, or whatever and, and to say, hey, you know what? Let's all remember together what God has done for us and the way He's called us to live. Jesus said, when you do this, remember me. That what he has done for us is his life was laid down, his body broken for us so that we could be restored. What he has done for us is his blood poured out so we could be forgiven and brought into relationship with him. And the way he's called us to live is shaped like the cross. To live our lives in a sacrificial, humble, loving way. So as we go into this song, we're going to be singing about the goodness of God, what we have seen. What I want us to do as, as we do that, if you, you can receive communion now or as we begin to sing that song, and as we do that, I'm going to pray in a moment. I want us to consider, Lord, I have seen your goodness, and I see it in my life. God, in what, what is one way in the week ahead I could more intentionally be invested in my family that they would know your goodness as well.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, you have been better to us than we deserve. You have been faithful to us. And like it says, like Moses found out from your own lips, God, you are a God of unfailing love to a thousand generations. And we are recipients of that love. And Lord, I pray that as we receive, as we remember the body broken for us, the blood spilled for us, that we would remember also that we are called to pass on this message, this truth into our family relationships. And Lord, I pray that when we don't get the instant gratification of instant change in those relationships, that you would help us persevere and play the long game. Because we know in each one of our lives, you played the long game for our souls. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.